Welcome, everybody, um, to the press conference. My name is Christopher, and I'm the Public Awareness Director for Activism, and I will be moderating this press conference. We will have about 30 minutes uh, for questions um, to Zen, uh, Jill, and Abby. And since we're about, uh, there are about seven people in the room, um, we have about four minutes per person. Please stick to the time. Um, I will uh, stop you when you, uh, you're uh, too, too long. So please um, state your name when you're asking a question and your organization that you're reporting um, for. And um, please uh, keep your question short and, and simple and precise. And uh, just for um, information, this press conference will be uh, recorded by us for later publication. And um, just uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand and then I will call you up. All right, um, this is it for me. Let's start. Any questions? Yeah, I'll start then. My name is Benjamin. I'm working for Mockbook today. It's a Munich-based magazine. And uh, often in political discussions and discussions such as today, I feel that uh, if, there's, if there's an enemy or if there's something that's being fought, uh, often, often activists or people are, are engaged in, in this fight. Um, don't manage to see or don't necessarily want to also criticize the other side. I feel like that often the enemy of the enemy is the best friend automatically. Is that something that Abby and Jill, uh, you also see, do you also fear slipping into those paths where suddenly you're so fixed on your one aim, on the one big enemy that suddenly everyone else becomes your friend or every other cause is positive? Uh, is this on? Uh, I, I never feel um, trapped like that because I see every single U.S. military intervention comes with this sort of media campaign to make you feel trapped in that paradigm where you have to denounce Saddam as a war criminal, you have to denounce Bashar al-Assad as a war criminal. I don't fall into those trappings. I just try to focus on the most destructive force, as Glenn Greenwald so eloquently stated, we are American citizens. Our country is subjugating most of the world <laughs> through brutal military might and economic oppression. So as my duty, as a citizen of, of that country, I feel like it is uh, absolutely essential to focus wholeheartedly on trying to end the system that is brutalizing so many people and oppressing so many people around the world. Um, but as I've said before, I mean, I, I don't hesitate to call out things that I see wrong, and I don't, I don't think of Russia as my friend, and I don't think of Bashar al-Assad as my friend. I just simply choose to pick my battles where I think I can make the most impact and the most effort, because piling on to this whole pressure where, you know, they call, basically there's a smear campaign right now to call leftists uh, Bashar al-Assad apologists who aren't den denouncing him, you know, denouncing him. Um, and it just reckons back to the Iraq war, and I'm just not going to fall for it. Yeah, and I'll uh, agree with all of that. Um, in being, you know, in, in being accused of having Putin talking points or, or being a Putin puppet, I mean, to my mind, the whole framing is just ridiculous and tries to take us away from what's really happening. Um, that is the critical issues of jobs and wages and the war economy, which is costing us 57% of our discretionary budget. 57% uh, is going to the war effort uh, and to the Pentagon. The next biggest expenditure is 7% going for various, you know, health and administrative and, and housing programs and so on. And, you know, so I'm, I'm not focused actually on being for or against Putin, rather, but being against a war machine that's trying to whip us into uh, war hysteria right now. And, I both support, you know, uh, f exposing interference in our elections. That interference should not be limited to just uh, foreign uh, governments or oligarchs. It's also about voter suppression uh, and so on. Um, but the real danger of this whole demonization campaign is that it becomes a vehicle for warmongering, for censorship, and for political repression. So, you know, as, as a political organizer, at the end of the day, people don't come out and vote or even get active so much 
about being against things. People have to feel like they're for something. And so for me, that's a big part of this too, is lifting up a system of, of international law, human rights, and diplomacy that can take us to a, a world that works for all of us and where we can all cut our military budgets and all of us, that means Russia too and China, we're all spending way too much, but the US is spending more than all, you know, the next 12 biggest spenders. So we're being most harmed by this system. And as Abby and Glenn said, we mostly, ha above all, we have to be responsible for what we're doing. So, you know, to me, it's not about whipping up a frenzy of what we're against, but rather lifting up what we're all for and where we can come together as a nation and as a global community. Because we're on one boat, and right now that boat is going down. And uh, we all need to build that lifeboat really quick if we're going to get out of here alive. Any other questions? Yes, please. Hi, Demand. So it's uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And uh, yeah, with more than 100 years of uh, political activism against militarization, and the second part is freedom, so women's rights and uh, participation. First, I want to thank you uh, having organized this because I think it's, it's, it's really um, a module to, to get information and to understand more and this is really a very, was a very rich evening. I don't know what we're up, but could you do Yeah, this? yeah, yeah. But I think this uh, has to be said also uh, somehow. Um, my question goes in the direction of uh, quoting a woman already in 1915, Lida Gustava Heimann. She is a peace activist living in Munich for many years and the city of Munich still does not acknowledge her work. She said the economy must serve the needs of the people and not those of profit and privileges. This is a quote which you brought up also today, but uh, what, and we are facing such a, a stupid world where our um, defense minister asks for 12 billion in addition to the military budget. We have a campaign which is called Move the Money from War to Peace. Would you be ready to support this campaign? Because the money is needed, as you said, um, of course, in different fields. And a, a last thing concerning all these new walls on new borders and militarized border management against refugees and using uh, development money now for securitization, so they say. Is there still hope for a better world? Um, they want you to think that there is not hope for a better world. Because if you're hopeless, you're powerless. So they're doing their best to disinform you and misinform you when, you know, as we mentioned earlier, there are no polls out there right now because I think they're very afraid of what they would find. And the case has not been made for you know, U.S. involvement in Syria and this latest uh, triple strike from the U.K. and the U.S. and France uh, in Syria. People don't want to see more militarization. They've really had it in the U.S. It's cost us $5 trillion. Um, we've created failed states, mass refugee migrations, and worse terrorist threats. How much have we actually secured the Middle East by doing this, killing a million people in Iraq, tens of thousands of U.S. soldiers uh, killed and maimed? So, you know, this plan is is a is a massive catastrophe. They can't argue for it, which is why they don't want it to be measured. They don't want to measure public opinion. I think, you know, we have the facts on our side. We have any, by any measure, you know, morality and ethics on our side. We've got practical solutions, moving the money on a grand scale. 
you know, from the bases, from, you know, this 57% of our budget massively cut it. All nations of the world should be cutting their military at least by 50% and probably a lot more and putting that money into things that we really need, like to combat climate change and create jobs and revive our economies. There is a win-win here right in front of our eyes the minute we, the people, stand up to make, uh, to make it happen. So I completely reject the concept of hopelessness. I think, you know, it's impossible until suddenly it was inevitable. And I think it's incumbent on us to see that it is inevitable, um, to see that the, uh, the walls are falling down right now, and it's up to us to make that happen faster and to make sure that the uh, alternative uh, is ready to rise up right now. As far as supporting your campaign, please send us a link at activism. Chris and I will have a look at it, and if it complies to what I believe it does, we are most ready to publish any of your stuff as, or interview you guys even. Yes, please. Hello, my name is Philip, and I'm currently writing a big article about social movement. As you know, uh, the 6080s are now 50 years ago, so this is kind of um, the trigger of the article. And um, looking into the world of my friends, I see that more and more people go to meditation, go to the awareness stuff, and there are so many good people, but uh, they are all so annoyed about politics and the media and everything we read. Um, couldn't we bridge these two movements together, the meditation awareness movement with the movement for political activism, environmental activism? Absolutely, and you know, as I think Abby was saying uh, during the discussion, we have to take care of ourselves, you know, in order to uh, keep fighting the power here. And certainly in my contacts with the meditation movement or the yoga movement or various religious and spiritual movements, they hunger as well for, for a world that is not violent and brutal. And they are denied by corporate media collusion they're denied an understanding that, that there are alternatives that are really right within arm's reach. So, you know, in, in my view, the real challenge for us is not to change people's minds, but to figure out how to do an end run around this systematic um, uh, blackout campaign against alternatives. And that's why I'm so excited about what activism is doing and about Abby's work, because this is communications on a grand scale. That's really the missing link here. The rest is ready to fall in place the minute we can get the word out. I, I would like to say something about spiritualism and stuff like that. I think it's great a way to combat stress, and that's what activists or journalists need. I just have a problem with it if it becomes individualized. Like I've c come across people that have thought, hey, all of this collectiveness and coming together and looking at issues and stuff, I, I don't want to be part of it because I found my spiritual self. I mean, and you know, I don't agree with that opinion. Uh, because if the bombs start falling, the spiritual stuff goes away. So as long as it is in spirit of helping activists and journalists and people who are trying to create awareness or trying to be direct, take direct action, I think that it, it can serve a great function. Uh, but when it becomes something privatized for an individual and takes precedence over these issues, then I don't see a compatibility uh, with this. But I mean, whatever somebody does personally, it's their thing, you know, as long as it doesn't become the dumb. I've been in certain groups where I felt like, man, this is a self-help group. Um, there's, these guys are not going to get anything done, you know, like they're just, ooh, you know. Um, and I've been in groups where people have actually integrated these thoughts into the environment. Like, it makes sense, obviously. We are all from the same planet, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it depends on how you interpret it, this how you carry it out, uh, as long as it doesn't impair the bigger goal that we have, uh, I think it's a great thing to do. I wanted to say something too. Uh, it really bothers me when people say, you know, I'm just not into politics, as if it's a hobby, as if it's like cars. Um, every single thing throughout your day is political. Everything that you do has political implications. So I think, and the whole meditation and spirituality movement, we need to 
show these people how actually we can integrate that into the activist sphere. And actually we need that, you know, we need that holistic approach to actually be surviving and, and continuing to fight and not being burnt out. But I think it's making people understand how they are political creatures and how if they're not into politics, well, politics is sure as hell into you and using and exploiting everything about you and your life and your family. So it's really pulling people out of that kind of egocentric um, drive and, and making them see the bigger picture. And if they're already into that kind of mentality, it shouldn't be that hard to do. And if I could just add one thing real quick. Um, in my experience, once people have the benefit of seeing you know, the reality that we are in the target hairs of 2,000 nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert that could be triggered at any moment, it is a very life-changing kind of realization, or the knowledge that the environment and the climate are unraveling really quickly, that the Gulf Stream could stop at any moment. It's really slowing down, it's meandering, it could be over and we don't know when that's gonna happen. We need to fight for the greater good like our lives depend on it. And it's that connection, knowing that your life depends on fighting for the greater good. And I, the, the facts are just so overwhelming right now that I find if we can share that, or when we share that, you know, it's very hard for people to resist getting involved if they have an option. And that's where you know, the corporate media is all about denying that option. And our corporate political parties as well are all about denying the, uh, the knowledge that this is eminently fixable if we get to work right away. So I think sharing the knowledge of the solutions and, and the pathways there is very empowering and mobilizing. One thing to add also, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think that Trump presents a, an actually really unique and wonderful opportunity, as hard as that is to believe. He's completely removed the mask of what the US empire represents and really what the bald face of capitalism is in its late stage. And so that's a space. It has you know, basically just shocked people to the core where they have no, I mean, even my friends who are just like total Burning Man community people who never like pay attention, now they're forced to. Um, they're waking up, you know, their natural parks are being privatized. I mean, this is, the national parks are being privatized. This is happening and it's good because if Hillary Clinton won, they'd be at brunch. Like that sign you see people at a protest, they're like, I would be at brunch right now, damn you, Trump. It's like, that's the problem. <laughs> you shouldn't be at brunch, you should be out there fighting for the bomb, the people who are under the bombs of Hillary Clinton, just as you are for the immigrants being deported by Trump. So I think it provides a space that is actually a really great opportunity for everyone to build upon. Franz, please. <clears throat> Um, I'm a political activist in quite a few, you would call probably the ultra left wing organizations, a peace movement, a political party also. Um, Attack is one of the organizations. Um, we had several um, people here in Munich uh, where we could help to get really good answers. And there's one question I always keep asking. Uh, because every time system change is mentioned. And the question is, how, how the hell do we get from A to B? Um, basically, it's, it's, it's four ways. The one is uh, democratic reforms, however they should come. Uh, a second one is the, the mega crisis, and then um, capitalism with, with uh, collapse by itself. The third one is uh, some kind of revolution. And the fourth one is grassroots from bottom up, which would take quite a very long time. And what I can see is that going the long way takes probably uh, ages. So what would be, how would you estimate that it comes and what would be your proposal to activists on how to approach that? <laughs> well, I think capitalism is eating itself and the pitchforks are going to come for the plutocrats and it, it's an inevitability. I mean, we're seeing capitalism eat up the world 
and uh, subjugate the masses, and, and it can't last. It absolutely cannot last. So it's not a matter of us building grassroots structures and kind of waiting for us to ultimately take over. It's that it will fall, and we have to provide those alternatives or have built at least some structures to pick up the pieces when it does, because it absolutely will. It cannot sustain uh, at its current form. Yeah. Um we're in a completely unique historic moment right now. The degree to which the global economy is being hollowed out uh, and preyed upon, uh, the extremes of wealth and poverty where five billionaires, super billionaires now have, have the wealth of half of the world's population, uh, where the environment is being hollowed out to the core and our you know, our, basically our, our environmental capital on which we survive is being devoured uh, and expanding war and nuclear weapons. We've never been here before. And so there's very little historical guidelines about how change happens at this point. In my view, we... There's a cheese <clears throat> What's that? When it's about guidelines, there's cheese There's, I'm sorry, there's what? Gene Sharp. Oh, Gene Sharp, right. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, right, right. all right. Okay. Let's, I mean, let's, let's. I'll just say, I think we need to do, we need to pull out all the stops. And all of us need to do everything that we can do. And for some, it will be building the groundwork for peaceful revolutionary change. For some, it's, um, uh, you know, I don't feel like we have to promote the collapse. We've got to promote the recovery. Mm -hmm. The collapse is happening by itself. Uh, we have to promote the recovery. We have to create the recovery in our own communities. I don't believe that uh, small change politics is going to get us there or window dressing reforms. They're not. And more often than not, they are efforts to put a break on you know, their, their distractions and their gimmicks. I think we need really uh, high aiming uh, System change that changes the basics of our economy, that undoes the financialization and the corporatization, you know, end corporate rights of personhood, et cetera, and the, um, the end run around democratic institutions through globalization and its, uh, its institutions that essentially are a power grab and a, a diversion against democracy. You know, I think we need very big solutions. We need public banks. You know, we need the right to a job. It's been articulated. I, I don't think there's any rocket science here. I think the missing ingredient is broad public engagement. We need to be out there like the people of South Korea were by the millions every weekend until their government fought, fell, or like the people of uh, East Berlin were out there, and I remember hearing Chris Hedges describe how the activists thought it was going to be at least 10 years, and the next week, the government was gone. You know, so you don't know when the wall is going to fall down. You just have to put your shoulder to the wall and push as hard as you can, knowing that your life depends on it. Then it's going to happen. A small comment. Uh, I know Franz, I've interviewed him a couple of times. Uh, why don't you invite her to anti Seco demo? Like and anti uh, Seco demo, why don't you invite Jill? That would be a good stuff. She she's a great speaker. That's the wait a second. That, that's the uh, demonstration against the Munich Security Conference, which is organized by Boeing and all of them. And all of the foreign ministers are here. It's presumed that they're planning war, but they're actually here to just talk about security and how everything is going. They've been doing this historically since how many years? Um, Seventy-five, uh, like ninety. Yeah, and and the world is where we are. Yeah, yeah, and and great. And I think this is a great opportunity. Maybe uh, this is one of the things that I wanted to say to your answer. I I I just want to say something. Like these are things. Like there's either a revolutionary change or there's a spillover change. There's either two ways. Like if I can sum up what you said. Like if we change something, like the public bank, that might spill over onto something else, and that might spill over to something else. I think if we want to do spillover change, it's going to come from the economy, because if you change that, you're going to change the way the military functions. You're going to change the way. Now, I think that might be a way forward. 
democratizing the economy, and I'm not talking about state taking over everything. I'm talking about local communities getting in charge of how their bank runs in their community, for example, or like we are doing an activism, how media runs in our community, activism Munich, you know, and hopefully activism Berlin, and everything will come out of this. Um, so I think that's the change that could spill over. But I think I revolutionary change like you know Berlin and Korea and stuff. Um, that could be the other path, you know, but I think for that you require the communication system that the corporate media have, and we don't have that. We have to be honest of what we have, and how can we overcome that is by creating networks, and that's why I'm proposing. Um, it's your decision, obviously, I can't make decisions for you. <laughs> I'm proposing you write to Jill, you write to Jill and Abby yeah. Uh, yeah. for the Great. big uh, yearly uh, peace demonstration mm -hmm. that takes place, Rammstein. I think we need to do stuff like having yeah, live stream, live streaming. Uh, if uh, Jill and Abby can make it, maybe they yeah. can come and li uh, live stream them while they are in right. another demonstration, creating mm -hmm. global empathy mm -hmm. between uh, your demonstration and a demonstration happening in uh, Washington, for example. So I think those things are needed for revolutionary changes, and I think you can play a big role in that. We already know that the time uh, next year is always in uh, first half of February. Um, so if you would probably that's. That's we guess, talk about that. What's, yeah. what's, 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 uh, mentioned? If you would like to join us here on the streets. It's a hundred, uh, more than a hundred organizations uh, on the streets, and more than two hundred organizations supporting it. And there's the peace uh, that's, uh, that's a all right, it's supposed, All right. not supposed to be a discussion. We need, to, we need to move on. We don't have that much time anymore. Abby, do you, do you I wanna... just wanted to say one really quick thing that I think it really does start with political education massively because how could we ever organize if people are just completely ignorant about what the system is and what it's doing? So, And I think we have a long way to go in America, which is really unfortunate because that is obviously the centrifuge of, of the economic system. So it takes a lot of work, um, but it's not impossible. Look at Iceland. Seriously, I mean, that's an amazing example of, of masses of people who just camped out and waited until they could take over. And now they have one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. Um, and I know it's a very small country, but it, 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 you have to gather inspiration from somewhere and you have to do what you can do. And political education is the key, which is why we're all doing what we do. All right, thank you. Uh, in the front, please. Thank you. Dark Konsejevich, Serbia. Looking for simply to say a better world. Uh, and I know that the world can only be as good as the people. And I don't think the bad people are the problem. They are just difficult. I want to think about the idea that good people are a problem as long as they are ignored. Ignorant. How to break ignorance of good people is the main problem. How to break ignorance of who? Of who? Of who? Good start. Yeah. 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 Look, I, 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 I used to work here as security in this place, okay? <laughs> I was sweeping the floors and I was uh, standing at the door uh, when there were events here. I was doing the ticket. Uh, I was on unemployment benefits for a while. And I, in America, I was very much in the party um, scene. You know, I've been in many places. I've lived in Pakistan 13 years. I've been in California for three years. I've been in Munich now nine years. I've been to many places from people and I have realized something that yes, there's ignorant people, but I don't like to phrase them. I think you have to reach the right way. How do you reach people? And the problem with uh, I see in the left is, and I'm very critical of the left, not because I want to demonize them, because I want to find constructive solutions out of criticism. That's what criticism is supposed to do. That's why I find it very um, funny that um, when these guys are criticizing uh, something, it's obviously saying you're a stooge for something. It's not. They're trying to do it to better the society, right? And one of the criticisms I have of the left is that they judge people too quickly sometimes. Oh, this is a new liberal. Oh, this is a, uh, no, 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 right? I'm not the type of person. I try to find ways of how, uh, and that's, the, that's why I'm media, because you try to look ways of how you can reach different people with different ways, you know, like without falling in the line of propaganda, which is providing half-truths. For me, prop that's propaganda. That's the uh, conventional definition right now. There's a classical definition, um, but I don't want to get into too much history. And how you get is, is how you moment it, uh, the right moment and the right content. And that is something that nobody can teach anybody. That's just you have to know who you're talking to and how you reach it. Nobody, uh, I've reached people um, while we were at standing at the bar, and they've become part of this organization. I've reached people um, by 
talking intellectually uh, with facts and uh, uh, military industrial complex and blah, 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 and how much GDP and stuff like that. Um, it's always different. Like there is no one solution and I'm happy it isn't because if that solution was there, then the powers that are right now would have used it long, long time ago. So that being said, I think you have, it's, it's a creative process that you have to discover yourself. I just want to add that um, the people who are disengaged from, the, from a corrupt, corporate-sponsored political system most often represent a progressive force. And usually when fascism or right-wing movements arise, they can only uh, prevail if there's a big political vacuum. And the objective, the primary objective for me is to engage the disenfranchised frontline communities in our country communities of color and immigrant communities and students and people who have been thrown under the, you know, under the bus by the current political system. 45% of Americans are not voting and it's largely disenfranchised communities. So to my mind, that's really the focus. And for me, when I unexpectedly won a televised debate, I realized, oh my God, we're out there in very strong numbers. We're just being silenced, being uh, disappeared. But if we can find our, you know, ourselves out there, if we can find a way to do an end run around the corporate media, which is silencing us and disinforming us, we have the power right now to take charge. 45, a 45% you know, plurality is a plurality. You know, in, in our country, Democrats and Republicans are, are like 24 and 29% right now of the electorate. You know, and it's, uh, it's 45%. The plurality is, uh, has rejected both of those political parties. So I breathed an incredible sigh of relief when I realized you don't have to actually change people's minds, because that's what I've been trying to do as a scientist, as a health provider. I've been trying to make the argument and change people's minds, and then suddenly I saw the evidence that they're already there, that what we have to do is just find ways to mobilize each other and break through the, the corporate silencing of, of uh, the greater good. And as we mobilize each other, we can break through. Thank you. Thank you. In the back, please. <clears throat> yes. Richard Forward from Munich American Peace Committee. We've been active in Munich since uh, 1983, uh, where we started uh, against the deployment of the uh, Persian missiles. Mm. My problem is with this big world politics, and there's very much activity here about solidarity, international solidarity, and it's all wonderful and it's very important, but there is a great lack in working at the local level. This doesn't mean it's slow, it means it is slow, of course, but it means it's creating contact with people who are not necessarily politically active for whatever reasons and gaining their confidence and making or helping them realize that you can achieve something politically from, from the bottom. And I think that the political activity here and uh, in, in other regions and countries are neglecting these possibilities. And Jill, you talked about that grassroots is, is starting with grassroots problems. And uh, I, I just sort of question this thing about, oh yeah, working at the grassroots level is going to take too long. I don't think we have any other possibilities. We're not going to get the uh, support Please come of, of the masses. Yeah. And what uh, do you think about this, or what, how is it in the States now? Um, I'll just say, you know, briefly that organizing in our communities is where we are most effective um, and where real change happens. It's got to be from the bottom up. And 
you know, I work at the national and international level because it's a missing link, but the Green Party as a whole is primarily focused on local politics and, you know, fighting for, to keep their schools open, you know, and uh, to have affordable food and, and health care. So it really is local. And I don't think there's any contradiction there. Um, often, uh, you know, a, a dialogue at a national or international level helps wake people up to the fact that there is a whole different agenda out there and then they connect. And that's something that I always try to do is encourage people to contact their local green parties and support local candidates and, and to fight local battles where we're much more powerful. So it's absolutely critical. And thank you for the great work that, that you've been doing. I was just going to say that I... Um, What's going on there? I'm also an ally of a socialist party that I you know, help organize with. I, I'm outreaching to my community every day. We mobilize rallies. We're talking to immigrant base because I'm in Los Angeles, which is a huge um, undocumented population there. So absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I think if you're not working with local candidates or parties, then you're, you're doing it wrong. Because like Jill said, there, there doesn't have to be a contradiction. You need to do both and you need to link the struggles. But I totally agree with you. I mean, that's what also Greenwald talked about today, uh, the fact uh, what he's doing in Rio de Janeiro with the uh, homelessness community. That's one example, what I think. But I think also I, I feel that's a great thing, and we provide a voice to grassroots activists. Uh, you were one of the people that I interviewed, I think, from the Munich American Peace Committee and also Franz. Uh, you guys, um, we are there, and we provide a voice. We want to get you guys out there. Uh, my definition of grassroots involves uh, international grassroots. I think the struggles that people are facing in Gaza or in Baltimore or in Puerto Rico, they're not very different. If you just break them down into what is actually happening, it's misuse of power and exploitation of voiceless people. And the job of the media and activists have a different job. Um, I think what Abby and um, Jill and Glenn are doing is one part of it. The other part of it, what we're doing is in the media is try to connect these struggles. So people say it's the same thing replaying over and over again. You know, um, Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. You know, so the facts are different. The people are different. The organized, the, the configurations are different, but it's the same game. So if you can get people to think about that, they'll be able to connect with others with empathy, love, and definitely change the way things are functioning. And that's, I think, what the media should be doing more. I wish uh, German media was translating Chinese content or Arabic content. I wish, I mean, we, a non-profit, small organization, as we were having the event, we had uh, people up there transcribing, uh, correcting, translating, ru uh, running voiceover, so we can get this out in German, so we can connect the issues, right? I don't understand why big corporate giants cannot, besides filling their pockets with profits, like you mentioned with the CBS stuff, um, I think six or seven billion dollars was uh, earned uh, during uh, Trump's uh, shenanigans uh, in the election season. I don't understand why there's no uh, real investment in creating translations, voiceovers, um, um, so a broader global community can connect their local issues with other people and create empathy with that. Because media, the job of the media should be to create empathy, right? So if you report on in the environment, you create empathy. Oh my God, like this is how animals are treated. This is how we treat our rivers. I mean, you create love and empathy because you're like uh, seeing that the environment is voiceless and it's being exploited, right? And it has a consequence on us. And if you're providing a voice to some other people and translating, you're creating empathy with each other, or at least you're attempting to. And that's what one of my main reservations was when we were creating activism, Monique, is we're going to be bilingual and not just if we've done some stuff in French, we've done some stuff in Greek, very little, like you'll find one or two videos on our YouTube channel, but if we ever gain the capacities to translate all languages, we will do it, you know, and hopefully that's the future. Right. Thanks, Sen. Do you want to add anything? Maybe? Um, I was just going to say that, you know, it may seem like an obnoxious and small step, but ever since I got into this activism, I always like either, you know, just wear a pin saying stop the U.S. war machine and, and just my daily errands, you know, people will see that. And if they want to open that dialogue or that space, that's just one more link and one more connection. It just sounds very small, but it really is just one more thing that I can do and everyone can do.
Thanks. So we're already over time, so please, the last question from the sir in the back. Uh, my name is John Cobb. I'm from Idaho many moons ago, and I worked with Dick, Munich American Peace Committee, and I've been here for 40 years in uh, Munich, and also helping with the anti seco things for uh, goes 30 years. But I've gotten involved, and uh, until I picked up, I heard you talking about cooperatives. And uh, I'm very active with the cooperative, and we provide health service. And what we do is we are a private cooperative, uh, and we cover people for the emergency cases. And we're made up with small cooperatives, minimum five people, and maximum whatever. But you, you must visit. That means they have to come together once a month, and we talk about what's going on. And it turns out there are several thousand people now. We have over 150 Solidarity uh, solid cooperatives. Uh, on the other hand, politics, the problem is how can I use this as a platform for something? For, because we provide all the services to these people. If they get unemployed, we help them. If they have a problem with the teeth, we don't cover the teeth. But we say, well, we'll loan the money to you. It's really, and and the thing is, you come in, you say, well, uh, I want to be uh, save money and do this and that. But after a while, you say, I want to be magnanimous, and you develop this confidence with that. But it takes years. We've been doing this now for about. Oh yeah, yeah. How can we um, get uh, politics into a group like this? Because. We, we had politics got and we had some guys that, that likes Berger. And so the, and we just closed down we have a, a long time uh, getting rid of this uh, political rights but they want to get they were just nihilists. they were against everything, all, against all politics. But uh, the thing is in the solidarity the mindset with the service out here is no politics. But isn't the whole entity being private and that you have to supply these resources for people in need, that is political. I mean, the fact that they are, you know, they're under privilege and they're not getting these resources that a private entity has to provide for them. And I think that make, making that link makes it political. Um, but it is a good question. I mean, if they're like turned off to that, I think just making them understand that they could choose a system that could provide that where they don't have to go. Uh, it's you know. political also. Uh, sorry, yeah, no, go ahead. It's political also because you're creating democratic structures. That's yeah. politics itself. You're not a hierarchy. So you're providing an alternative to capitalism. But um, did you say a Reichsburger uh, was coming to you or what? Yeah, he was in one of the cooperatives. Yeah, but you know, if you, uh, I just want to say, I mean, a Reichsburger is a Nazi, right? Um, and I think it's a, I'm not. Okay, what I'm just trying to say is when you provide a service and people might come to you who you do not share your opinion with, right? Like, I, that's like, should Nazis view activism? I say, yeah, maybe I can change their opinion, you know? Like, and there's this big thought over here in Germany since I've been here that uh, you shouldn't uh, have a dialogue with people or they shouldn't uh, consume. That's like saying, okay, no more U-Bahns for Nazis. Like, what's going on? Like, you know, you're just gonna polarize it. You gotta have a factual dialogue. You gotta, gotta reach people. And I, I think if they're part of your organization or they attain the service, I didn't understand it correctly. But anyways, if you give a service to Nazi, a healthcare service, I think it, it's a f human first, then a Nazi. I think uh, in that way, I'm really like, your humanism, is something I really admire, you know, in that sense. I also just want to say one more thing. I don't thing. agree with that there's, at all. <laughs> there, there's like, um, in Berlin, obviously that's inciting violence. That's why something different is a gun and like, uh, but like we have a lot of people that refugees that came here, a million people and the same arguments were being made in reverse. Like, right, uh, you can't just generalize people when they come. You gotta first treat humans, their basic needs, provide them food and shelter, warmth and clothing, and then let's see what's up, right? Okay. Um, but that, that if their ideology is based on you not existing as a person, mm -hmm. that I, I don't agree I, with. I agree, but like what makes us different from them, right? The fact that they wanna kill you. And I admit, if the guy had a gun or something, he's saying, give me your service. It doesn't service, matter if he has a like, gun. His mentality is dangerous and I, oh. 
but anyways, like I just wanted to give a small example, like something similar that you're doing in Berlin. There's this thing called Sanctionsfrei, Sanction Free, and Sanction Free is the organization that actually people, when the state decides here to cl cut you unemployment benefits and you go through the social net, they're the ones that give you legal support and they're the ones that give you financial support without any conditions attached. And I got to know them when I was on unemployment benefits. They told me, Zen, you're doing great work and stuff like that. I'm gonna, uh, we, we, I'm like, no, no, activism is now employing me. And things had changed by then. So I'm really, uh, sort of these things are, I think when you combine them and you, that's why if you guys are doing this, contact me. Great, glad to interview you. I think you, if we interview people like you, we can inspire similar people that, you know, are trying to change something. All right. All right, thank you very much. Um, we're uh, overdue, so um, we're gonna close the press conference now. Thank you very much for your participation to all the media organizations and uh, associations that were here today. Um, last year, after our Snowden event, uh, unfortunately we had very little media coverage about all the important discussions we had, so we uh, hope that this year we can increase a little bit the communication to the public. So thanks again for being here, and thanks again to Jill and Abby for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan, for joining us. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, have a good uh, trip home, and um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.